My name is Sharon, and I have been on Intercom's customer support team for the last two years. So one of the main things I've learned is that no matter how internal a decision or change that you make seems, it always has an external effect on your customers too. Back when I joined the support team, we had very little lockdown, but there was one strategy introduced early on that was crucial to our success. It's a pretty key concept for support teams of all sizes, but it's especially important for a support team helping a product in its early stages. And that is, don't make promises. Now, I know when you're on the front line actually talking to customers, there's a very real temptation to make promises in order to secure a customer or keep them happy, even if just in the short term. So maybe you indulge that one VIP and you tell them that their obscure feature request is a great idea that you'll definitely be building a little bit down the line. But you can't know that anything is going to be built for definite in those early days. What you can and should know, though, are the principles that guide your product team. Because truly understanding those principles is the customer support team's secret to success. It allows you to spot the difference between a viable feature request, like, say, an extra option on your settings page, and a probable empty promise, like that obscure feature that your VIP is just hell-bent on having. And when you spot the latter, saying no up front shows your customers that you have a solid understanding of what your product is and isn't trying to be. So for features that don't fundamentally add to what you're trying to achieve long term, just say no and don't promise. But how do you say no, not promise, and keep customers feeling happy? The key is saying no with why. So giving customers context is essential in order to help them keep feeling valued and bought in. At the end of the day, you're building your product for them, so you should make sure you let them know that. Explaining why you said no to somebody's feature request makes saying no to it a whole lot easier and frames it in a whole new light. Because knowing that something wasn't just a mistake or an oversight, but rather a deliberate decision actually goes a long way. So your customers are people too, and by sharing that extra detail with them, you're allowing them to understand the decision you had to make and maybe even empathize with the fact that, yeah, sometimes you do have to make really tough product decisions. So for an intercom example of this, our messenger doesn't force visitors to leave their email address before they can start a chat. But some of our customers, maybe even some of you here tonight, really, really wanted that and thought we just hadn't gotten around to building it yet. But in actual fact, that feature doesn't fit in with our philosophy. So we want to make it as easy as possible for somebody to get help, and we feel like that would be a bit of a barrier. So explaining that when we say no frames and own a whole new light and makes it easier for both the customer and for us. So if you need all this context, how do you make sure that you have it? Through a great relationship with your product team. Now, when your company is relatively small, it's a lot easier for this to happen. So support in CS or product in CS can work pretty closely. Things like hopping into each other's Slack channels or popping over to their desks, it totally works. And that was definitely what we did. But as we started to grow, we realized that unless we wanted to drive our product engineers crazy, we were going to have to start to structure how we worked with them a little bit more. So at first, that looked like having monthly meetings instead of ad hoc help. And when that wasn't enough, we changed the cadence and made the meetings weekly instead. But soon, even that was too much work for one person to own on the side of their normal role. So context and information started to get lost in transit and never actually made it to our customers. So. We figured we had to do something about it. So we made a brand new role, a product support engineer. And these were essentially support engineers that worked within our product teams. So along with having to be the voice of our customers in product and engineering decisions, they also owned the flow of information between product and support. So streamlining how our teams work together wasn't easy. And it definitely took us a while to get right. But once we did, it directly impacted and improved our customer's experience, because now it was someone's core job to understand the why and share it with the entire CS team. So now we had another role within a team that was already growing pretty fast. And as you add more people, naturally, you add more layers of management. But this was something that we resisted doing at first, because we knew once we add those layers of management, 
it means that the decision makers are going to be another step removed from not only our customers, but from the people on the front line who support them every day too. And when we were just a handful of people, we actually all reported into Jeff, who you're going to hear from later, my boss. Um, and it was fine. It worked really well. But like I said, we were growing pretty fast. So if you think that a manager should give, I don't know, roughly 10% of their time to each report, when they have 10 reports, that's all their time gone. And with so little slack in the rope, if somebody needs some extra coaching or guidance to get better, the time's just not there and it doesn't happen. So the quality of support that they're actually able to provide slips. And ultimately, your customers are the ones that feel the pain. So to try and fight that and help Jeff reclaim some time, we started to entertain that idea of adding management a little bit more. And at first, to help ourselves ease into it, we fell back on dotted line reporting. So what this basically meant was more senior people on the team were overlooking and mentoring newer teammates, but in reality had no official responsibility for them. And it was fine as a temporary solution, but if you're thinking of trying it, you should know that it does have some weaknesses that aren't immediately obvious. Responsibility slipped through the cracks, like who owns responsibility of scheduling staff to work a public holiday? And if you were to think of all the public holidays in Ireland, which one was the one that you would least like to have to try and schedule a last minute cover for? Yeah, St. Patrick's Day. So we had a very eventful St. Patrick's Day and scraped a skeleton crew together, but it was less than ideal. Our response times were slow because we were short staffed. And again, our customers were the ones that felt the pain of this internal shortcoming. Now on the upside, when the tipping point came, after the St. Patrick's Day from hell, and when we knew we had to add this layer of management. Having had dotted line reporting actually made the transition really easy because the people who were already acting up as managers just naturally slotted into these new positions. So while all of this organizational growth had a long-term really positive effect on our customers, the actual rollout of it wasn't always easy on them. Context now have to travel through a lot more people. Adding new layers of management made that more difficult. And so did spreading people out geographically, which was our next growing pain. So since day one, we have built our product in Dublin and brought it to market from San Francisco. And having those two offices meant that we had 16 hours of support cover right off the bat, which is great. But that's still only two thirds of the whole world. And our customers in that other third, this third, had to wait very, very long times to get support, and it wasn't good enough. It wasn't a customer experience that we were happy to give. So, enter our first remote hire. We hired a guy called Skyler, who was going to be a support engineer and work to cover our previously unmanned time zone. So we gave him two full weeks of onboarding, and then we waved him off. Problem solved, right? We had a remote team. Well, maybe not because we failed to consider how we were going to support him. We never thought through things about, like, how are we going to get Skylar the information he needs when he needs it? So often he'd have to wait a full 24 hours to get his questions answered. And communicating this wait time to our customers made us look sloppy and disorganized. And that only got worse when one remote engineer became two, and then four, and then a small remote team. Aside from the obvious issues of not being able to get information to this team fast enough, other things began to break. Not recording team meetings or forgetting to share notes from our company all hands began to slowly erode the sense of inclusion that this team felt. And they began to feel out of the loop and disengaged. And so then not only did they suffer for that, but so did the customers they were trying to help. Now, we've since improved that, don't worry. And thankfully, we didn't forget that remote team tonight. And they're actually all here in Sydney with us. Maybe some of you were speaking to them outside earlier. So while I have this very large stage, I would actually like to take a second to say thank you to that remote team. Lads, for your patience um, while we've tried and continue to try to figure all this shit out over the last few years, and for all of the things you have taught us about how to scale a support team, thank you so much. Sydney, you want to help me give them a quick round of applause? Yeah. 
So, one of the many things that this fantastic remote team we have helped us understand was that when you add a remote team, there's actually a lot of legacy language that needs to change. We were really used to saying things like, hey, Dublin and San Francisco, when we kicked off a meeting or when we sent out email updates. And I know that sounds really small and insignificant, but to a team who are already on the outskirts and feeling a little bit left out sometimes, that really matters. So we had to actively create new habits and make sure to actively create the, or include those teams in all these announcements and things. We also learned that what's obvious to the person next to you and what's obvious to somebody quite literally thousands of miles away are not the same thing. So you need to communicate the seemingly obvious things. Until I started to manage one of our fantastic remote engineers, I never quite realized how very, very much information I share with my team in conversations that happen offline, at the pod or making coffee. So I really had to become conscious of that and err on the side of over-communication. Now, when I feel like I've communicated the details of a message half to death, that's when I know I've probably covered all the bases. So, you've ironed out all the creases in your internal structure, you've avoided making promises, and you've shared context. And yet, it's still not working out with some customers. So, what then? Well, sometimes, customers just aren't a good fit for your product. And even the greatest CS team can only do so much. Now, the idea of actually breaking up with a customer and telling them that they shouldn't continue to use your product can be a really weird thing to try and get your head around because you've spent all of this time and effort growing and scaling your team all to make sure you can help enable success for them, and now you're just going to call it a day. It never feels good, but sometimes it is the right thing to do. And if you don't trust that and know that breaking up is OK, then you run the risk of having frustrated customers who are struggling to use your product because they're using it in a way that it's simply not designed to work. And no amount of remote engineers or fancy management structures are ever going to be able to fix that. Now, this sounds like a real negative to end on, but it's actually not. It's a positive. Because by focusing on the people that you really can help and help get more pro uh, value from your product, you're doing them a, a better service and, and breaking with others is actually the best way to go. So at the end of the day, the interactions that your customers have with your support team shape how they think and feel about your product in general. And growing that product, just like growing a support team, is really hard. And we've learned not to try and hide that. Because customers can understand all these internal challenges if you allow them to. After all, these things that we call customers or clients or users, believe it or not, they're actually humans too. Thank you so much for listening, Sydney.